great outcome and making sure it's a great experience and we do it all for the lowest cost, not whatever people decide to charge or at higher costs. The C means it's coordinated care. Right now, if someone doesn't show up for their follow-up care or isn't compliant, well, that's their problem. Nobody's at risk, and we end up with a system that's very, very fragmented. For the first time, bundled payment sets up incentives to coordinate care, to make sure there are good handoffs between providers, hospitals, and follow-up care between the primary care physicians and the patient, so that all the care is better coordinated. We don't pay for coordinated care under fee-for-service, but now coordination of care becomes a big, big deal because we are at risk financially through this new payment system if things don't work right. The E stands for evidence-based, meaning there are some procedures and some ways that have been shown in the literature and we believe them to be best practices that lead to good outcomes. Now these are known, and they've been published through clinical trials, and they are in the literature, and we are going to begin to see more and more insurance companies and the government through Medicare and Medicaid begin to pay only for evidence-based care. If you want to stay in the hospital an extra day or two, great, but we're not going to pay for it. If you want to do more tests, more treatment, more scans, great. We're not going to pay for any of these either. You can do all you want, but the evidence shows that this is the best practice and this is what we're going to pay for. So that's the new model of care. It's based on more integrated care, more coordinated care, and it's going to be in and around evidence-based outcomes for certain procedures and certain illnesses. Well, if that's the care we need to deliver, let's go and look behind the scenes now, over here, at what kinds of organizational models we should put in place so that we can be successful under these bundled payment arrangements. And again, we have another acronym, ACE. Let's go through each of these. The ACE stands for accountable. We have to have an organization and a structure that leads to accountability. That means taking a risk payment and distributing the payments out and still have enough at the end of the day for a profit margin that's needed for everyone. So we need to have an organization that can accept risk. That's called a risk-bearing organization. And that's managing the risk, lowering the cost of care, coordinating the care, and making it more integrated and, of course, more affordable. Next, the C stands for comprehensive. Patients love choice. They like to show up in a variety of urgent care centers. They like to show up in the ER. They call their primary care physician. They travel different places, all kinds of events. And when they leave the hospital, there's outpatient therapy centers, further testing and treatments, and lots and lots of follow-up, including home health care and an emerging field called eHealth Solutions. So we very much are in need of a comprehensive range of services and providers in many different sites and with many different models. And the E stands for efficient. We need to have some efficiencies, meaning we're going to lower the cost of care. And most of this legislation is not set up to slash health care costs 10 or 15 or 20 percent. It's meant to bend down the ever-rising cost curve just a couple of percentage points. If we can drop the rate of growth by two or three percentage points, we would say that this is a fabulous piece of legislation. But we just have to begin to move that cost curve down on this ever-rising set of health care costs. So that's the model and organizational structure that's going to be needed under bundled payments. So let's go back and see what happens to Pat under a new bundled payment arrangement. Now Pat will not be able to discern fee-for-service or bundled payments, and really shouldn't. 
but there's going to be some things that may be a little bit different and you may wonder what's really going to change. Let's go explore some of those. Remember, we said that after the episode of care, Pat needed to go back to see the primary care physician in just three days. Let's say it's day two, it's 5.30 in the evening, Pat's at home feeling a lot better, doing pretty well, and the phone rings. Pat picks it up, and who's on the other end? It's Dr. Goodwell's office, calling, and they are asking a lot of questions. They've never called before, and they want to see how Pat's doing on his medications. They want to know what you're eating for dinner. What's your plate look like tonight? How many fats? How many carbohydrates? What sort of protein intake? Are you weighing yourself? Did he fill that prescription? Is he taking it as it was prescribed? The reason this is a big deal is that on many newly written prescriptions, many patients don't fill these prescriptions and don't comply entirely with all of the instructions. What we are seeing is the emergence of a category of a new healthcare worker in America called the professional nagger. And they are on the phone trying to badger, wheedle, cajole, and convince people into better healthcare behaviors. The second big change we are going to see is when Dr. Goodwell suggested a three-day post-discharge follow-up visit to Dr. Goodwell's office. In walks Pat the patient, but instead of going into one of those smaller exam rooms, they go right past those into a larger room filled with seven other strangers with exactly the same condition. What is going to happen is Pat is experiencing something called a group office visit. Now, once you get past the initial shock, patients really like having group office visit. Well, what's going on here? Well, they can share what other people are going through, and people love to talk about what's going on in their own conditions, and they pick up lots of helpful tips on what others have gone through or are going through and what practical things have worked and what things might be tried with, say, medication compliance or diet or sleep and exercise. Now, these visits are always monitored by a nurse so there's no bad information. But a group office visit shows a high degree of patient compliance and patient satisfaction. Now, the third change is something that's called the Intel Health Guide. It's a device that sits in people's homes that helps them manage their health care and what they are going through to achieve even greater compliance. Every time Pat steps on that bathroom scales, immediately that information goes directly to Dr. Goodwell's office and into the patient's medical record. Likewise, they put a blood pressure cuff on a few times a day and it too goes directly there as well. There are embedded algorithms and when any of these conditions get out of compliance, a phone call is made from Dr. Goodwell's office to the patient asking, hey, what's going on? Now, is this very cost effective? Under fee for service, it is not very cost effective. In fact, it's $79 a month for the rest of the patient's life. But under a bundled payment system, it seems like everyone wants to help pay for the cost of this important device. Why is that? Because if we can reduce unplanned readmissions back to the hospital and not having the patient bounce back into the hospital within 30 days, then we all do better financially. And so insurance companies, providers, even the patients want to help pay for this new device because it helps with compliance and it's shown that it's cost effective and helps hold down rising health care costs. Lastly, let's go visit very quickly Acme Services. Acme has 50 employees and they have a number of choices that they need to make. They can be grandfathered or not under this piece of legislation, but here's the real choice. Do you opt out of even offering health insurance and send Pat and all the other employees into something called a state health insurance exchange? One for every state that will be set up and functioning by 2014. 
Now there's a penalty, $2,000 per employee if you opt out of offering health insurance, but not for the 50 employees, they are free. The 50 employees don't cost the company anything. So we've run the numbers, and for ACME, if they decide to opt out of offering health insurance, they can save $94,000 a year and be able to give Pat and all the employees a dollar hour raise. Well, there are two things to finish up. Number one, as we went behind the scenes on the payment side and we moved from fee for service to bundled payment systems, there is still one more option. That is full capitation. This is where we ask doctors and hospitals to be fully at risk for anything that would happen to Pat. We are paid so much a month to keep Pat healthy. And if Pat never goes near the healthcare system, never accesses care, the providers do very, very well. But if patients get into a lot of illness and injury, it costs the providers and this capitation program an awful lot of money. Most providers are not interested in this type of risk, and it's called an HMO, a health maintenance organization. Very few places in the country still offer this. Some places still do, but it's something that we just don't like as a country when it was first introduced in the 1990s. But that's still an option and has been very effective in lowering the use rates and really saving costs. But as Americans, we don't like the fact that it restricted our choices and we didn't like the way all these incentives were set up. One last thing before closing. There is not one word in this piece of legislation in 2,500 pages that has any patient responsibility for their care their lifestyle or their choices. Patients are not at risk for anything. So they can engage in poor health practices, never see a physician, smoke, drink, don't wear their seat belts, ride a motorcycle without a helmet, do a hundred other things that are their choices and there are no penalties nor any financial incentives to have them adopt healthier choices. We think that's a major challenge for this piece of legislation. We have to figure out how to have more patient participation, more incentives by the patient in their care and the cost of their care if this is really going to be a successful piece of legislation. So there it is, 2,500 pages of legislation. But if you go behind the scenes, you begin to see that the way you pay for care, bundled payments or other risk or sharing arrangements are going to change the way care is dispensed, the way care is managed a lot differently in the future than in the past. Most providers think we can stay on top of this. These changes we can make the best of this legislation, but we will have to go back and revisit this legislation every year, enhance it, tweak it, make some changes, but it fundamentally moves us away from fee for service towards another way of paying for care and bringing 32 million people into the healthcare system and giving them access to an insurance mechanism. Those are all good things for the future. Good luck on your healthcare reform journey.